What I'm going to talk about today is the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation, also called TMS, to enhance psi using mind-matter interactions as a model. My collaborators are Malcolm Binns, Jed Meltzer, Rohila Hashimi, and Robert Chen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the key messages right at the beginning, and then I'm going to repeat them at the end. So the first message, and first let me say that TMS can either enhance brain function or it can reduce brain function, and the effects are reversible. So the first message is that reversible TMS-induced lesions in the left medial middle frontal region can significantly enhance psi effects as measured by mind-matter interactions. And what we found in our sample of 108 um, participants is a significant effect at P equals 0.006 with an effect size of 0.38. The next message is that our study represents the third replication suggesting this finding. And another message is that psi effects, they may be very small and hard to replicate, but the reason for that is that they may be blocked by the brain. So the, the message there is that many of the studies uh, in psi involve uh, normal individuals who have no uh, brain lesions, either permanent or TMS-induced. And these are individuals where it's hard to find effects because the brain is blocking them. So that individuals with reversible TMS-induced left frontal lesions, they may, be, they may comprise an enriched sample uh, for studying psi in a way that the effects may be larger and that they may be more reproducible. So in terms of an outline, I'm going to review the rationale for focusing on the brain in the mechanisms underlying psi, and I'm also going to present new data from our TMS study in 108 participants showing that reducing frontal brain function can enhance mind-matter interactions. So an important question is, why should we focus on the brain when studying psi? And this is really important because many psi researchers do not focus on the brain. Um, and I think the reason we have to is that no matter how you look at it, the brain is part of the equation for psi phenomena. If there's no brain, there is no psi. And um, all psi phenomena require an observer, and observers have brains. So brain is part of the equation, and I think it's essential that um, we include that in studying psi phenomena. Now, identifying brain mechanisms mediating psi, um, they can lead to new methodologies to study psi. They may lead to practical applications of psi. And I can tell you it is necessary to include the brain in psi research in order for psi to be accepted by mainstream science. So in terms of background, the idea of the brain as a filter to inhibit psi or to block psi goes back to at least the early 1900s. And Henry Bergson, in his attention to life theory, he uh, postulated that the brain acts as a filter to inhibit psi. And he said that the purpose of this filter is to prevent information overload. So if uh, there was no blockage uh, uh, of psi with all the, this information uh, that could be coming in and also mind-matter interactions, um, if it were really widespread, uh, we would have so much information overload and there would be chaos because of the mind-matter interactions. So we evolved for the brain to actually block psi. And he said the deficits in, the, in this filter lead to the emergence of psi. Now, what Henry Bergson didn't do, he, talked, he did talk about the brain as, as a filter, but he didn't localize the filter to the frontal lobes. So what's the rationale for postulating that the psi filters in the frontal lobes? If you look at the literature on psi, you'll see that psi-enhancing states are often associated with reduced self-awareness. Now, the frontal lobes, they function to increase self-awareness. So the idea is that reduced frontal function 
may simulate the psi enhancing state of reduced self-awareness. So the initial research uh, that we did was to study psi in individuals with frontal lobe brain damage. Now I want to explain the experimental setup. We used a portable random event generator called a REG. The REG produces zeros and ones with equal probability at a rate of 200 bits per second. Now each sample of 200 bits comprised a trial. So the outcome per trial was the sum of 200 bits with the expected sum per trial equal to 100. And the participants are asked to try to influence the output to achieve values higher or lower than 100. We translated the numerical output of the reg into movement of an arrow on a computer screen to the right or the left. Now, the reason that we did this is because it's somewhat difficult for participants with uh, frontal uh, brain damage to think high numbers or low numbers. So it's a lot easier for them to focus on moving an arrow in the direction that it's pointing. So the arrow um, was on the screen. It started at the midline and it pointed in the direction that participants were asked to move it. And if numbers uh, produced by the reg were above 100, this moved the arrow in the rightward direction. For numbers that were below 100, the arrow moved towards the left. And we asked participants to concentrate on moving the arrow in the direction that it was pointing. So this slide shows you what the participants saw. So if the task was to get the arrow over to the right side, they saw this screen with an arrow pointing to the right, and they were asked to concentrate on moving the arrow in the direction that it was pointing. And if the task was to have the arrow go to the left, this is the screen that they saw. So here there's an arrow pointing to the left. The next slide is going to show you a video of the arrow moving on the screen for the right intention. So that's what the participants saw for the right intention trials. Now what we did in terms of controls is we had the reg run without anyone in the room right after the participants carried out their intention tasks. Now this differs from some studies carried out by others where there are no experimental controls and where the comparison is to an expected theoretical output. So what we found in our initial studies with uh, patients who had uh, brain lesions was as follows. We had one um, participant who had a focal left frontal lesion due to a tension pneumocephalus and another participant with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And what we found that was that there was a significant effect in moving the arrow, but only to the right. And then we looked at the lesion overlap uh, in these two patients. And what we found that the area of lesion overlap was in the left medial middle frontal region involving Brodmann areas 9, 10, and 32. Thus, the significant movement of the arrow to the right was contralateral to the site of lesion overlap in the left hemisphere. So this slide shows you a figure of the brain indicating where the left medial middle frontal region is. It's this red area with the arrow pointing to it. So what we did next is we carried out a TMS study. Now the reason that we did this is that it's very difficult to find large numbers of individuals with a focal brain damage. However, with TMS, we can induce reversible lesions in the frontal lobes in large numbers of normal individuals and obtain a large sample size. So we did this and we had an a priori hypothesis. And this is that healthy participants with reversible TMS induced lesions affecting the left medial middle frontal region will show larger right intention psi effects 
compared to healthy participants without TMS-induced lesions. Now, this a priori hypothesis was documented in our Vial Foundation grant before the study started. We used a TMS protocol called continuous theta burst stimulation. This reduces cortical excitability with an effect lasting about 20 to 30 minutes. This slide shows you the study design. There were 108 participants. They were randomized to one of three TMS groups, left medial middle frontal lesion, right medial middle frontal lesion, and sham stimulation. There were 36 participants in each group. The sham stimulation was carried out on the left side at the same site as the left medial middle frontal lesion group because the a priori hypothesis was re related to the left medial middle frontal region. So let me tell you what the mind matter interaction task was. Participants were sitting in a soundproof room and they were asked to influence the movement of an arrow to the right or to the left. And there were 500 trials for each intention. The order of the right and left intentions were counterbalanced. Now, as soon as the participants finished the 500 right and left trials, they left the room and then we ran a series of 1,000 control trials where the random event generator was running without anyone in the room. So I want to explain uh, first about the timing of the events, because this is important in terms of the potential wearing off of the TMS effect. So the time between the participants having the TMS and, have, and starting the experimental session was about two to three minutes because they had to go from the TMS room to the room where um, they had to get set up to try and influence the movement of the arrow. The actual experimental intention sessions where they were, had to, where they were asked to uh, uh, influence movement of the arrow took about 20 minutes. Now, we initially assumed that the TMS would last the entire 23 minutes, or approximately 23 minutes, without wearing off. Now, we found that without accounting for a potential wearing off of the TMS-induced lesion, the test of the a priori hypothesis was not significant. So we then introduced a waiting procedure. Now, this is a procedure that was applied to reduce the influence of observations collected after the potential wearing off of the TMS-induced lesion. Now, the reason that applying the waiting procedure doesn't affect the a priori hypothesis is because the a priori hypothesis was about the presence of an effect, not the duration of the effect. And what we found with the waiting was that when we compared the left TMS group versus sham, the a priori hypothesis was significant at p equals 0.006, and the effect size was 0.38. Now this slide shows you the data. I'd like you to focus on the graph on the left. Now this shows the first 500 intention trials. And these are the trials that are closest in time to the administration of the TMS. Now on the top, we have the left TMS, right TMS, and sham TMS. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, we have the right intention and left intention for each of the groups. On the y-axis, we have the average reg output. And here, at a reg output of 100, this is the expected mean if the reg output is random. Now, there are red bars and gray bars. The red bars represent the intention trials, and the gray bars represent the control trials. Now, the test of the a priori hypothesis is for the right intention trials, we look at the intention trials versus the control trials in the left TMS group compared to the intention trials versus the control trials in the sham group. 
And it's that interaction that was significant at p equals 0 0.006. Let's look at the output of the reg for each participant. If you look at the left TMS group right intention, you can see that the majority of the participants had an output above 100, which is in the rightward direction. Uh, this is the median, and you can see a relatively symmetrical distribution, and there are no outliers. This suggests that the majority of participants in the left TMS group for the rightward intention did, in fact, have an output um, of the reg uh, that was um, above the expected mean of 100. You don't see that kind of pattern in the other groups. Here we see the exploratory analysis in the right TMS group. Here you see the right intention and control trials and the left intention and control trials. You can see that the median is close to 100 in all conditions, and there was nothing significant in the right TMS group. I gave you the key messages at the beginning, and now I'm going to give them to you again at the end. We found that reversible TMS-induced lesions in the left medial middle frontal brain region significantly enhance psi as measured by mind-matter interactions. Our study represents the third replication suggesting this finding. Another key message is that psi effects may be very small and hard to replicate, but this may be because they are blocked by the brain. And a final key message is that individuals with reversible TMS-induced left frontal lesions may comprise an enriched sample for studying psi. And this may lead to studies with larger effects and studies that are more easy to replicate. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging the Bial Foundation that funded our research. And on that note, I will stop. Thank you.